we uh, will uh, start with the second technical session on uh, issues in GSTR 9, filing of GSTR 9 on portal, consideration in closure of books for financial year 1819. To handle this session, we have an eminent speaker, none other than uh, CA Venugopal Gella. May I request our uh, chairman, uh, Shuram, to escort the speaker onto the desk. Welcome with Boke. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, now I would like to give a brief uh, introduction of uh, Venuka Polgala for the benefit of the new members. See, Venugopalji is a partner in uh, Venu and Vinay, qualified in the year of 2002 by securing all India 45th rank. He is also a certified information security auditor. He has also completed various other certificate courses from ICA, namely DISA, course on business valuation, course on internal audit, course on fraud detection and forensic accounting. He has also completed a one-year course from IM on data analysis and business intelligence. He is an active speaker at ICA on GST, ESP on technology and its implementation challenges. He has authored various industry specific handbooks on GST, conducted workshops on filing returns with ease. He has developed a lot of Excel based free utilities on GST like JSON reader, creating JSON files, JSTN validator. Composition versus regular benefit analysis, GST impact, reader, etc. Apart from audits, he has uh, hands on uh, coding in VB.NET or Python. He also reviews database design. He conducted various workshops for uh, corporates on use of technology, improve efficiency at work using Excel, building automated reports from uh, accounting and financial applications. He was behind in the development and managing of a cloud application like Tax Mile, Insta Financials, and others. With this brief, brief introduction, I present before you Venugo Palgala. Good morning, members. Welcome back from the break. Uh, I thank Bangalore branch ICA for giving an opportunity to be in front of you and share some of my views on critical issues in GSTR 9 and also filing of the GSTR 9 on the portal and consideration for closure of books of account for the financial year 1819 in respect of filing of GSTR 9 Yeah. So the agenda is also on the same lines and I am making a small presumption that uh, Annapurna Madam had briefly dealt on provisions of GSTR 9 and 9A and you have made note of it and Madam very smoothly and calmly dealt entire GSTR 9 so I am very happy for that. I would start with one disclaimer so uh, also Annapurna Madam in the earlier session said okay this is my view and Venu can have his view uh, trust me, GSTR 9, what is there in the government portal, the notification 74, is the only document which is officially there on GSTR 9. Now, whatever the interpretations which we are making and whatever the statements which we are saying and some of the speakers may be very assertive in saying that this is the what the data that should be presented, you should all read as if it is their views. So, I am indirectly saying that whatever I am saying is completely my view. So I'm not a representative of GST. So, but we have taken a very due care in looking at various provisions. What is the intention of the government when they are drafting, and how that should be read, and how the data needs to be filled in for filing the annual return. An annual return is something which is very new to us. It's not that we we, we have the practice of filing an annual returns in the past. In the past, we only had audits, VAT audits. So where a turnover exceeded certain limit, we have the concept of the audit, but we never had the 
concept of the annual returns. So, but this year we are looking at both audits and the annual returns. So, every registered person who would be filing their returns. So, for the first year we would be having a regular dealers filing GSTR 9 and the composition dealers filing GSTR 9A. So, the TCS e-commerce operators provisions came only from October 18. So, for financial year 17, 18, definitely there would be no 9B. Apart from 9, we would also file 9C, which the second half the speakers will be dealt, will be dealing with in detail. So, there would also be a situation where one registered person would be filing 9, 9A and 9C. Like they have registered under composition scheme and during the year their turnover exceeded, they have opted for moved out of composition scheme and their gross turnover is exceeding 2 crores. So they would also be filing for the same financial year 9, 9A and 9C. So the point one needs to note is for filing of the annual returns there is no threshold limit and everyone should be filing the annual return. So one common mistake which sometimes happen is okay I have nil returns or my turnover is I have registered but my turnover is less than 20 lakhs okay I need not file the annual returns or the annual returns may be applicable only to some. So this being the first year there should be a due care to be taken if we have say 1.3 crore registered SSEs all such dealers have to file their annual returns. Yeah. So let's look at and currently the due date for filing is 30th June which is otherwise by December of the subsequent financial year. For the first year it has been extended till 30th June 2019. So the points you would be need to note is though it is annual return for the first financial year that is for 17-18 the data that needs to be presented in the annual return is only the details of 1st July 2017 to 31st March. So the first three months data would not be incorporated into your annual return. You can file the annual return only if you file GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B. If you have not filed, you would not be able to file the annual return. It's mandatory you have to file that. And there is a late fee, Madam has covered that. And if you are not filing it, you would be getting the road notice, same as per section 46 where every uh, Every registered dealer has to file the certain returns within 15 days. If it is not filed, the notices would be issued. And there is no threshold limit. Even a nil return has to be, annual return has to be filed. So this is one area where people may end up doing some mistakes saying that, okay, I did not do any business or my turnover is very limited. So having registered, one needs to file. And this is not a PAM based filing. It is a a just in best filing. So if someone has multiple GST and IDs, so multiple annual returns to be filed. So this is one additional lot one members have to make. <laughs> Couple of things. The questions would be there in the mind is what is the source of information for filing my annual return? Should I consider the data which is there in GSTR 1 or should I consider the data which is there in GSTR 3B? What happens if my taxes are erroneously excess paid in 3B or I have short paid the taxes in 3B? I have declared the turnover correctly but the taxes were wrongly reported or vice versa, taxes were correctly paid, the turnover was wrongly reported. Can any of this discovery, why I am saying discovery is when we are filing the returns, so the focus was is like file the return. Well, the portal is up, let me first file the return. And uh, your smile indicates that okay, you have all gone through such issues. The second other challenge is books of accounts never gets closed on the month end. Have the books of accounts getting closed on 31st March or 20th April, even the tax audits wouldn't wait till September or October. So there would be some accounting entries that flow into the books or so some purchases where the marketing team had made some purchases or stores have made purchases, the invoices would flow to the accounts at a subsequent point. Some sales invoices were raised but goods did not move and it was realized erroneously. There could be n number of reasons why the books were not closed or the books were corrected subsequently. And the returns might have been corrected, might have not been corrected. 
only by during due uh, audit you would realize that okay some taxes were not paid short paid wrongly paid instead of paying 18 percent you paid 12 percent or you missed out some portion of turnover you didn't know that it is a turnover or you have paid it as IGST, as agency, it is C pluses. It could be any of situations that would have happened. Likewise with the input tax credit. So earlier we were not availing the input tax credit on the capital assets unlike it, unless it was a plant and machinery. But now we are eligible for to take. Or an accountant is not aware that certain credits are blocked. Anything the accountant looks it into the invoice as there is if there is a IGST, CGST, SGST, he would account it as an input tax credit. The person who was filing the returns, whatever was available in the returns, would have considered in fact. So now during the audit you realize that you have taken an erroneous input tax credit or you have missed out taking an input tax credit. So how do I deal with that in the annual return? So what, what shall I do with the new items that are getting discovered while filing the annual returns? Now, you may ask this question, have this not been discovered during the tax audit or the stat audit? might have not got discovered because the audit, the statutory auditor or the tax auditor has a limited exposure to the GST and they are more well versed with the uh, either the CARO reporting or the, the income tax related provisions. So but when, when it comes to the GST audit, that is when the focus on the correctness of the GST audit would have been determined. Right? Everyone of you are in the same boat that there is some differences or if any one of you have your books your GSTR1, GSTR3B is perfectly matching. Anyone like that? If someone like that, maybe it was an accident. <laughs> or it was an ill-written. So, it's like including my own firm returns. We had some differences. Right? GSTR1 was some difference. Then later it was correct. Right? Now, the very important point one needs to notice, how do I deal with this in my GSTR9? And there would be some more questions that would come up is, should I definitely, should I give any cognizance to the returns which have been filed? <coughs> Isn't it my GSTR 9 and annual return, should it not be the books of accounts? Whatever is the data which is there in my books of accounts, shouldn't that be the base for filing my annual returns? Right? Because end of the day, okay, I did whatever I did in my GSTR 1 or 3B, now I would like to disclose my correct turnover or correct input tax credit should I not base the books of accounts as the basis for filing of the returns? There is another question or another thought process which would come to someone, someone of your mind, right? Yes or no? So do you have answer for this? Now you have a view on it. I think I would take this as my basis. By the way, I also have a view that this should be the basis. But let's look at what should be the basis and what is my view. So, let's have a quick recap in understanding the GSTR 9. Then, let's get into the table by table, what are the issues and how do we handle those issues when we come into the table by table. Line. Let me tell you, whomsoever has drafted the annual return and the annual audit forms, very beautifully drafted, considered all the possible situations or scenarios. If you have been given an opportunity to draft, maybe you would also have drafted in this way, right? So GSTR 9, if I have to broadly tell, the GSTR 9 has been divided into six parts. Part 1 is basic information, so table 1 to table 3 is dealt in the basic information, let's ignore it. Part 2 is a turnover and a liability related disclosure. You have table 4 and 5 in part 2, which is on turnover. Part 3 is your input tax credit. So table 6, 7, 8 deals with the input tax related tables. So after your turnover and the input tax credit, the obvious thing is net liability and the taxes payment. So part 4 deals with the, the tax payable and the tax paid details. Table 9 handles this information. Now we all know that there are some errors happened in filing of the returns. Those errors have been subsequently corrected. Maybe in GSTR1, GSTR3B. So, handling the subsequent corrections, both from the liability side and the input tax credit, is dealt in part 5. Table 10 to table 14 deals with it. And we have some other information that needs to be reported. The other information is in part 6, 
So table 15 to table 19 deals with the other information. So this is the macro view of understanding what is there in GSTR 9. So once you get a macro view, you can easily get into the details of it and filling off each of the information. When you log into the portal, by now you would have noticed there is a button called annual return. So on the screen itself when you log in you will hit this button annual return. In case if you moved out also, you can go to the, uh, the services returns annual return. Again it will take you to the annual return page. So you have an annual return for 1718 and 1819. So if someone are ready for 1819, you can consider filing for 1819 also. Okay. So we have two modes of filing of the return, prepare online and prepare offline. So currently the offline is still offline, so you can only file online, but very soon that would also, you can file it through offline mode also. So you click on prepare online, you see all the tables, so they have ignored table 1, 2, 3 because you have logged in, so you are selecting the just in name and the, finance, the period for which you are filing. So the table 4 to table 18 is denoted in various files. <coughs> and as you are seeing on the screen, there are some data which is auto-filled, auto auto-populate. It's like even before you do some data entry, your GSTR 9 is auto-populated by the portal. But that doesn't mean that is your final GSTR 9. They have facilitated that maybe this is your data for your annual returns. Right? Having said that, since there is a data, like we have the option of next, next, next submit. So it's not that okay, you are seeing some data, you, are, you can go ahead and submit it. But they are they have facilitated in fetching out the information. So you will see all the tables, table 4 to table 18. Table 19 is the late fee. So table 4 to table 18 all the tables have been designed, designed so you will be seeing each of the grid. So whatever you have seen in the earlier slide on the macro view of the GSTR 9 when you log into the portal you will get this diff little different view. So let us understand the first one part 2. So I am not getting into part 1 the basic information. Let us get into part 2 where you are disclosing your turnover related data and the relevant liabilities there are. So you would be disclosing all your turnover and the liability. So part 2 has two tables. Basically this is a details of outward and inward supplies during the year on which taxes are payable. So part 2 has two tables. Table 4 deals with the transactions which have tax liability. Table 5 deals with the transactions which do not have tax liability. So very important table for a quick reference would be table 4 because these are the transactions where you have the tax liability. And even table 4 they have beautifully drafted. So what are the transactions that would have your tax liability is the taxable turnover made to unregistered suppliers or end customers is in 4A, your B2C, your B2B turnover is in 4B, exports made with payment of tax is in 4C, SCZ supplies with payment of tax is in 4D, deemed exports is in 4E. You might have the advances received on which you are paying the taxes is in 4F. Your inward transactions which are liable for taxes is in 4G. Then credit notes, debit notes, amendments are from 4I to 4L. This is the data you would have to report for your table 4. So the question that would come is, the portal has auto-populated this information. What is the source of which they have auto-populated this information? So the source with which they have auto-populated this information is your GSTR1. In fact, if you take a close look at it, these are the tables that resemble your GSTR1. GSTR1 table 4, you would report all your B2B supplies. Table 5, B2C large. 
table 6 export transactions table 7 your b2c supplies table 8 exemption exempted nil rated non gst table 9 any credit notes debit notes so you have a table wise detailed disclosure which is done in gstr1 the first question to everyone is should we consider gstr1 which is reported in reporting the values in gstr9 see there is an obvious underlying assumption is your books of accounts gstr1 and gstr3b should be matching okay but the fact that's the assumption the matter of the fact it doesn't match some or the other reason some turnover not disclosed or some turnover not to be disclosed whatever let's not get into that. so the the practical thing is it's not much now what is the basis of the information that needs to be reported in table 4 of GSTR 9 so question is to you all what do you think from the books books of accounts ok any other views GSTR 1 last view obvious answer GSTR 3 b if you fill any other new information then after GSTR 9 you will have four sets of data books of accounts GSTR 1 GSTR 3 b and GSTR 9 right and uh, even the assisting officer is waiting for you to file your GSTR 9 so because that is why he hasn't called for any assessment for 17, 18 yet right. so let's look at now what should be my source of information in filling these details if you read the instructions given if you read the instructions given the instruction says the aggregate value of the supplies made to the consumers 4A as B to C on which the tax has been paid shall be disclosed here and it would also include supplies through e-commerce table 5 B2C large table 7 B2C small and the amendments made in table 9 for B2C large and table 10 for B2C small in form GSTR1 may be used in filling up these details and if you see for B2B similarly they, they say the same thing the values which is reported in table 4A or 4C or form GSTR1 may be used in filling up these details so if you go to any of the tables which is mentioned here it gives the same information so what is the answer so should we use books of accounts in filling up these details or should we use GSTR1 it is not books of accounts it is no way saying books of accounts right so let's first rule out this option that the turnover as per books of accounts would be reported here that is not the answer so the second doubt that would come up is then okay if not books of accounts then is it GSTR 1 or GSTR 3 B so when I look at the instructions it appears that okay it is the data of GSTR 1 now let's if we read these instructions again it says the turnover on which the tax has been paid it says the turnover on which the tax has been paid and in filling up that you may use the details which are there in GSTR 1 right? it is not saying that you shall use the details which are there in GSTR 1 now in GSTR 1 I disclose a liability of 1 crore would that mean that I have paid a taxes of 1 crore whenever I file my GSTR 1 does it get added to my electronic liability register and in 3B I should offset the liability whatever is there in GSTR 1 is that so do I offset based on GSTR 1 data or GSTR 3B liability which I am disclosing 3B so whatever the data which is there in GSTR 1 the taxes may have been paid may have not been paid what is the data which is expected to be reported is the turnover on which the taxes have been paid now if all the GSTR1 data which you have disclosed and the, term and the taxes have been paid then you can write royally adopt the data of which is there in GSTR1 and you can go ahead and file your annual returns 
So what is expected to be reported is the turnover on which the taxes have been paid. So do you pay the taxes based on your 3B liability or 1 liability? Now, the data to be filled here, the source of information, would it be 1 or 3B? So maybe again we should rule out the option of GSTR 1 and we should consider the values which are there in 3B. Is that clear? Okay. I'm coming back to the instructions again. Now, the only small thing, very small thing to be noted, even here I would say it is May with 3B. Because in 3B, even the turnover might have been wrongly disclosed. I might have made an error in reporting the turnover in 3B. I have reported a turnover of 1 crore in 3B, but paid a tax, ideally for 1 crore, say at 18%, I should have paid 18 lakhs, but I paid a tax of 1 lakh 80,000 rupees. I have paid a tax only 1 lakh 80,000 rupees. So the turnover for which I have paid the tax is 10 lakhs. Right. So the government is actually now wanting to know you have paid taxes month over month. As a government, government has received the taxes which you have paid. They would now like to understand the taxes which have been paid. The reason for payment taxes which have been paid. You are now doing a reverse working of the taxes which have been paid. Just because you have erroneously disclosed a turnover of 1 crore in 3B but paid taxes for only 10 lakhs, it doesn't mean that in your annual return you will disclose 1 crore as your turnover. You would go ahead and disclose a turnover of 10 lakhs. What is 10 lakhs? 10 lakhs is the turnover for which you have paid the taxes. And that turnover which you have paid the taxes for, you are doing a detailed reporting the way you report it in GSTR 1 how much of the turnover pertains to B2C, how much of it is pertaining to B2B, how much of it is exports. Right? So, if I have to put a final answer to it, is the source of information may not be exactly books of accounts, not exactly GSTR1 and not exactly GSTR3B. It is a plain reading of the turnover for which the taxes have been Paid. Now the next question that comes is if you read the heading of the table 4 you will ask that okay what in the GSTR 9 or in the instructions if you see the second instruction it says the turnover for which the taxes have been paid or payable can be disclosed here and additional tax liability can be paid through GSTR 9. I would come at a later point where in an appropriate table that information to be disclosed. But when it comes to the table 4, the table 4 which is part 2, the information that it is asking is, it may be noted that the supplies for which the payment has been made through form 3B between July 17 to March 2018 shall be disclosed here. So what goes into table 4 is the taxes you have paid in 1718 and the turnover for which the taxes you have paid in 1718. So now if you have to take a macro view of what is your tax payable maybe as per books of accounts is the tax payable so payable has been paid in 1718. Some amount of tax would have been paid in 1819. Some amount of tax wouldn't have been paid till date and you are now paying through DRC 03. So your tax liability is split into three categories. So the first category of the tax liability which is paid in 1718 would be reported to table 4. So the second category of the tax liability which is paid in the year 1819 would have been reported in the part 5 in your table 10 and table 14. Then you also have the additional liability which you need to pay you have after you submit your annual return you still get is there any additional liability to be paid would you like to be pay, pay that in DRC 03 you can pay through DRC 03. 
So your liability is split into three different tables. Now, some may say that I would disclose everything in table 4 and the portion which is paid uh, subsequently I will again disclose in table 10. If you do so, you are reporting the liability twice. Your table 10 is not an information table. Your total liability would be calculated and or the total taxes you would be you have paid would be read as your table 9 taxes paid, table 14 taxes paid and DRC 03. You should excuse I will be using the table numbers but please make note of these table numbers because this very soon you would also get used to these table numbers. Yeah. So the source of the information is exactly not books of accounts exactly not GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B. It is only the turnover for which taxes have been paid. Just because you have a turnover and you are not paid the taxes, it doesn't mean that you have an opportunity to report it in GSTR 9 as if the taxes have been paid. So they have also said that the additional payment of taxes if it is anything is due, which is noted as an additional liability for 1718, not disclosed in 1, not disclosed in GSTR 3B, may be disclosed in, the, in this return. All that you have to ensure is this return is not a place for claiming a refund of the extra taxes paid, claiming an input tax credit which you have not availed, a reversal of an input tax credit which you have availed erroneously. So GSTR 9 is not a place where you will be availing an additional credits or reversing a credits. You will not be making a claim for refund for additional taxes which have been paid erroneously. Clear on this so far? Moving on, let's get into the table 4 specific. So when you look at this tile and when you click on this tile, this tile is automatically pre-filled with the data basis your GSTR1. It is only pre-filled this with basis your GSTR1. You have to again look into the details as to what is the turnover for which you have paid the taxes and you have to correct it. So the critical information for filing GSTR 9 is payment of the taxes. Maybe by way of cash or by way of credit, but have you paid the taxes? So in another way of reading it, you can consider GSTR 9 is an explanation to the government that you have paid so much taxes for 1718 on what account you have paid the taxes, you are giving an explanation back to the government by way of GSTR 9. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So the question is, what does what is this government auto populating this data with? Is it auto populating with the data of the amendments we have done? or is without the amendments. If you see in the next section, there are also some values which are auto-populated. I have just taken the screenshot. So government will auto-populate all the details with amendments. Let me give a small example. I have reported my turnover as 100 in the month of January 2018 and issued a credit note. Such credit note is amended, say in the, issued in the month of March credit note gets captured separately. So I disclose a higher value of 100 and the amendment and the credit note as 20. Situation 2, I have disclosed it as 100 erroneously as against 80 and I have corrected it as 80 by using table 9 subsequently. Even this po the portal when it is capturing the information, it will take the original value as 100 and the amendment made subsequently, it will capture both the information. So portal has both the information, it is capturing both and net of it is the net turnover which gets disclosed in 4N. 4N is the first table number you should remember. There are a lot of sub table numbers which you should remember, I will give a recap at the end. But this is the table where you would be having a total turnover and the total taxes which have been paid in the financial year 17-18. So that is first checkpoint which we should be looking for. So originally I have reported as B2C subsequently amended as B2B or erroneously reported as a B2B some distinct but I know it is B2C which I have nullified B2B and corrected as B2C in GSTR1. 
How do I report it in my GST or nine? Again, the plain answer to it, you have paid a tax of 100. You bifurcate this tax of 100, how much is B2B and how much is B2C? You need not be worried saying that I would report B2C, show it as an amendment, again report B2B. You show what is the value eventually, whether it was a B2B or B2C, you have paid a taxes for. The next thing, I, what has to be reported in table 4 is taxable value and not the transaction value. Say owing to the valuation rules, we'll say, take classic example, construction industry, I collect 100 rupees but I pay tax only on 2 thirds. What should I report it in my table 4? Table 4 should be reported only with the 2 thirds and not the full value. What you are reporting is taxable value and not the transaction value. Where do I park this difference? This difference you can consider reporting it in table 5 because Annapurna Madam clearly said you can report it under non-GST supplies because it includes no supply also. Like via sale of land is definitely a no supply, it is a scheduled 3 item. You can consider including it in in the table 5 and even if it is not included but it is a transaction which is exempt supply so you will not have any tax liability. Can I report a transactions sales in made in 2017-18 the credit note is issued in 1819 can this be reported the answer is no it is only credit notes issued in 1718 it may include the credit note reported subsequently but what are the transactions to be reported is the transactions or the document date which is 1st July 17 to 31st March 2018 and do I report it net of amendments or gross of amendments your table 4n is the net value you are reporting to the extent possible preferred report the original value report the amended value get the net value into 4n but to the extent you are unable to bifurcate extract it reporting the net value may not be a serious issue in my view <coughs> moving on to the next table table 5 table 5 is the transactions where you do not have a tax liability. So the transactions which do not have tax liability, the first in the export section, earlier in table 4 we did exports with payment of taxes. All the exports without payment of taxes definitely do not suffer it. So we report all the outward supplies without payment of tax. The next is reverse charge outward supplies. I am a GD, I am an advocate, so all my, I'm a security agency. Okay, security agency definitely not for 1718. But where my turnover is paid under reverse charge by the recipient, but still it's my turnover, I report it in table 5. I also report my nil exempted non-GST supplies in table 5. So, the total of it is including credit notes, debit note. The next important table number which you should remember is your 5N. 5N is your 4N, which is your tax liability summation plus 5M export turnovers, uh, so non-taxable turnover summation, minus 4G. 4G was inward supplies liable to tax. It is a liability table, but not your turnover, and it doesn't match with your p &L credits, outward supply, or the tax calculation. So, for you to match with your books of accounts, or etc., you would report the, or you will take the basis whatever the data which is there in your 5N which is total turnover which is total turnover which can match with your books of accounts and the, the total liability. Ideally this liability should match with your books of accounts. But this liability you are only restricting to the extent the taxes which have been paid in 3B in 1718. So to the extent taxes which is not paid in 1718 this table or the value in 5N would not be capturing it. Some questions that would come up is the tax values reported in 5C to 5N. So will there be a liability? Obviously there will not be any liability. All this taxes column would be blank. You will only be reporting the turnover. Credit notes, debit notes, again you would be reporting the same thing. There is one common question which will come is I have made exports. LUT is not undertaken. It's forgot to take an LUT. But reported as exports without payment of taxes. Both in GSTR1 and GSTR3B, I have reported as with pay without payment of taxes, but I did not execute LUT. 
Now, how do I disclose it in GST online? Should I report it under with payment of taxes or should I continue to report under without payment of taxes? Now, my view, the matter of the fact is these are exports made without payment of tax. There is a procedural lapse of not undertaking LUT. Just because there is a procedural lapse, it doesn't change the coloration of the transaction itself. It doesn't become exports with payment of taxes. So hence, you would still be reporting this transaction in the table 5. Because you have not paid the taxes for it, you have treated these transactions as exports without payment of taxes. So your 5N includes your taxable and exempted. It will include your original reporting, amendment reporting. It will include your debit notes, credit notes and critically non-GST. The definition of non-GST is nowhere in the GST Act. It is only brought in by way of the returns and an explanations in the returns by which they are saying that non-GST would include no supply. For example, you got a dividend income or you got profit on sale of some securities. So all this forming part of your PNL but never part of your reporting in GSTR 1 or 3B, you will include that in your non-GST supply so that you are matching with your audited financials or your books of accounts so that your total turnover matches. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So question is, does pure agent transactions forms part of this? In my view, it doesn't form part of this because take an example that you have collected money from your client for payment of taxes. So you collected it and you remitted the taxes, doesn't become your turnover, it is not forming part of the PNL. In my view, it is not forming part of your GSTR 9 also. Yeah. Moving on to part 3, table 6, 7 and 8. So table 6 is the input tax credit related. Now in table 4 we looked at what should be the source of information. Right? Books 1 and 3D. Now when it comes to the input tax credit, what should be the source of information? Here any doubts? Okay, what are the sources we have? Again books of accounts. 3B. So what is the data that we should adopt in reporting? 3B, 3B, 2A books. 3B, 3B, 3B. Whichever is more, very uh, someone has said. We should start with 3B. Okay. Let's first negate this whether books can be included or not. Can I take books data? Can I take books data for input tax credit? I have set the GSTR 9 in that fall bar boundary. You cannot claim a new input tax credit. Just because it is not there in your 3B, you cannot now put it into GSTR 9. You missed out in books, you can't put it into 9. You missed out in 3B. So it is not at all the data as per books. So the next comes is whether it is 3B or 2A. 2A should also not be considered because there are some instances where some erroneous entries came into my 2A. So my 2A credit value is higher than my turnover. Someone has used my system to report someone else. So 2A is like the coffee which is served outside. If you want you will take it, if you don't want you will not take it. What has to be considered is the credits which has been taken. So. Can we agree that it is as per 3B? Yes. Yes? Okay, let's see. Let's see my view. So, table 6 is input tax credit await as per. I don't think it is not as per 3B. Table 7 is input tax credit reverse. Okay, this is as per 3B. Table 8 is reconciliation of 2A. So, I am of the view that the input tax credit is not what as per 3B. If it is not what as per 3B, then what is the other source we have? Is there any other source that, okay, there is input tax credit taken? So let's look at that. In 3B, when I am taking the input tax credit, table 4 of 3B is used for taking the input tax credit. 4A has 5 subcategories. 4A1 import of goods, 4A2 import of services, 4A3 reverse charge credit, 4A4 ISD credit, 4A5 
our favorite table, all other credits, we just report everything in there. 4B reversals, 4C a net input tax credit taken, 4D is ineligible credit. This is our reporting in GSTR 3B. What to be reported in table 6 is whatever is the credits taken. The credits that come to your electronic credit ledger. The electronic credit ledger comes one source is through 3B. 3B is just one source which comes to the electronic credit ledger. There are some direct credits come to your electronic credit ledger which is your trans 1, trans 2, ITC 01, ITC 02. So 6B to 6H talks about some credits of 3B and 6K to 6M talks about credits of electronic credit ledger. Okay, so you will say, okay, can I take whatever the data which is there in by 3B for 6B to 6H? To that extent, can I rely on what is there, there in 3B? Again, in my view, the answer is no. So what you are reporting is the credit taken in GSTR 9 as a re-explanation. The way you have to look at is download your electronic credit ledger there are two columns the transaction date and the tax period what you have to look for is the value of the credits which have been taken for the tax period now the return would have been paid subsequently whatever you are seeing in the red color are the returns which have been filed subsequently for the tax period July 17 to March 18 whatever the net credits which have been taken is what needs to be considered for reporting in table 6, 7 and 8. Let's get into each table by table. Let, table 6, I said 6B to 6H is the source of information is for GSTR 3B. Now, though I say GSTR 3B but it is not a exact GSTR 3B. What am I trying to communicate? In GSTR 3B, take an example, I have imported the goods, paid IGST, where does it get reported in 3B? Column 4A1, import of goods, yes or no? But I have erroneously reported under 4A5, all other credits. I have taken the credit, I have taken the 1 lakh IGST paid on import of the goods, but I have wrongly reported in my 3B in a column other than 4A1. If I have to take the credit, whatever, a summation of whatever which is there in GSTR 3B, then in my GSTR 9, I should report it under 6E. 6E is the column for import of goods. If I am taking a literal copy from GSTR 3B, I should report it in 6B. If I go by the original transaction, it is import of goods 6E. If I go purely based on GSTR 3B, all other credits, then I should report it in 6B. My net credit in my 6I, I am not changing the value. I am not increasing the value of 1 lakh to a new number. I am not bringing a new number by saying not 3B. I am taking the correct credit whatever is there in the 3B. But the question is, when you are reporting it in the 9, would you report it as import of the goods or would you report it as same all other credits? Without taking an additional credit, a transaction originally is an import of the goods but erroneously reported in all other credits in 3B. How, do you, how would you consider reporting it in 9? Would you consider same as all other credits or would you report it as under import of goods? So if it is import of goods, then reporting under GSTR 9, is it a copy paste of 3B? No. It is the value which went into the electronic credit ledger. You are giving an explanation to the credit which you have taken through electronic credit ledger. You have availed the credit. You are explaining the source, how you have availed, on what account you have availed under GSTR 9. By doing so, you are not incorporating a new credit nor reversing a new credit. Is that clear? Yes. Can we use the same, uh, same 
logic for uh, purchase returns declared net uh, I, uh, under 4A5 you declare ITC net of purchase returns instead of showing total credits in 4A5 and uh, purchase returns in reversals. So the question is, I have the credit which is moving out to my electronic credit ledger is not 4A, it is 4C. 4C comprises of 4A gross availment, 4B reversal out of it, 4C is the net credit. Equivalent, we have table 6, credits availed, table 7, credit reversed. Next table which you should remember is 7J, net credit availed. How do I report this transaction? And especially when there are purchase returns, I have availed only a net credit. How do I report this transaction is the question. I'll give one more little detailed example and I'll explain. So let me first look at the other parts of 6 and 7 and I'll take up this question. So now 6A is auto-populated by the government portal. Whatever you have taken in the 4A, it is auto-populated. The explanation of 4A is what you are reporting in 6B to 6H. And the total comes as 6I. 6I minus 6A, which is 6J. Ideally, 6J should be 0. Because I said, you are not taking a new credit in GSTR 9 nor reversing a new credit. Ideally, it should be zero. Which means there are situations it will not be zero also. I will give you some examples when it cannot be zero. But one other checkpoint when you are finalizing GSTR 9, look at the value which is coming in 6J and if it is not zero, you should look at, okay, is there an error? The way you are looking at 5 and, and your books of accounts and the tax liability, the next thing you should be looking at is your 6J, whether 6J is zero or not. Then you have other credit, trans 1, trans 2 credits. Whatever the tax period pertaining to July to March, you would be availing those credits. When you click on the portal, you will get the same information. 6A is auto-populated. 6B is now asking you to do a detailed entry. It's just that you have an additional work. So the third thing which you would be looking at is splitting of the input tax credits so availed between inputs, input services and the capital goods. You definitely cannot saying that, okay, I cannot bifurcate now. In fact, the uh, credit rules as per the books of accounts, every credit availed should be segregated between input, input services and capital goods. It is not a re new requirement from GSTR 9. It is a requirement which exists in the rules already. So you have to do this bifurcation. Now, you might not be having sufficient uh, accounting done to uh, assimilate this information and report it, but you should do a reasonable work in extracting this information. Do not put everything in the inputs or input services or capital goods. There is a very logic behind how the department is taking because department looks at each business, each turnover, they have some certain input output ratios. right? So, if your inputs are X, they know based on basis your business, there is a certain amount of profit margin. So, cash paid, the taxes paid in cash divided by total liability denotes what is the, your profit margin. And the, that ratio should also get correlated somewhere with your inputs and input services and capital goods and depending on industry, industry these ratios change. So, just because that, the credit might be completely correct, you have bills you should also put an effort in segregating these credits. And one simple way, you look at your input tax credit register by vendor or by supplier, you can just categorize, group them by the supplier and you will know automatically which are which is input, putting a one pivot to your input tax credit register, you would be able to achieve this. So, the question is, the credits which have been wrongly reported in 3B, 4A1 to 4FI, can I correct it in GSTR 9? The answer is 100% yes. Uh, next question, I have availed a credit of 100 in the month of June, reversed that credit say in the month of Jan, so in the, this June to be read as July, sorry, uh, availed in July, reversed in the month of Jan because I have not paid to the vendor within 180 days, then reclaim that credit in the month of March 2018. I have availed 100, reversed 80 in Jan, 
reclaimed in the month of March 2018. Situation 2. I have availed the credit in the month of July 2017, reversed in the month of January 2018 because not paid to the vendor. I have paid to the vendor in June 2018 and I have claimed this credit in the month of June 2018. How do I report this credit in my GSTR 9? So you have two tables for a credit which is like a forward charge credit or the credit which should match with your table GSTR 2A there are two tables table 6B and table 6H table 6B plus 6H should be the counterparty submission so in the first case you would report in table 6B as 20 and in 6H as 80 and the total credit as 100 you would be reporting 20 in your 6B, 80 in 6H, the total as 100. But if you look at your 4A, in the month of July you have taken 100. In the month of January you have reversed 80. Again in the month of March you have taken 80. Your summation of 4A or which is auto populated in 6A is 180. But what you are now reporting in your GSTR 9 table 6 is only 100. So you have a gap between 6i and 6a there is a gap and it is not 0. So there are many instances, there would be many instances it would not be 0. Right? So but you should be having a working whenever those instances it is not 0. And you should properly look at how do you reconcile the total credits which is available which is 6m. Moving on to the next table which is on reversals. Reversals are dealt in table 7. So Annapurna Memo has explained all the various types of reversals. Now let's take one more example. Example on the reversal of an input tax credit. The same example let's take the I have availed an input tax credit of 100 in the month of January 2018 as 100 whereas my eligible credit was only 10 in the month of February I realized that I have availed more credit by 90 I have reversed the credit in the month of February by 90 net input tax credit which I have taken into my electronic credit ledger is 10. 100 in February, 100 in January event, 90 in February reversed, 10 is the net input tax credit. And let's keep that there are no other credits in the whole of the year. How do we represent this transaction in GSTR 9? Should I take 100 in table 6? Reversal of 90 in table 7, it definitely doesn't fit into any of that 7A, 7B, 7C but I still have any other reversal under 7H, any reversal I can park 90, net input tax credit 7J, one other number one needs to remember is 7J net input tax credit as 10. So should the reporting be as 100 in 6, 90 in table 7, 7J as 10 is option 1. Option 2, in my 6B itself, I am taking a net input tax credit as 10. Reversal in 7 is 0, net input tax credit in uh, 7J is 10. Would it be 100, 90 and 10 or 10, 0 and 10? What is the right way of reporting? Option 1, 100, 90 and 10. Okay. Any other view? Option 2, 10, 0, 10. <laughs> okay. Let's look at what is the impact of choosing both the options. If I take 190 and 10, my 6i will match with 6a. 6a auto populated 100, I have also taken uh, 100, reversing in the table 790, my 7j is 10, matching with my electronic credit ledger summation. Option 1 seems to be right. But what are the challenges in option 1? If I go to the option 2, 
my 6a is auto populated with 100 but in my 6b it is valued only as 10 so automatically it shows that I have reversed some credit in GSTR 9 it appears that okay because your 6j will be showing a value as some negative 90 there is a gap between 6i and 6a so as I said in the beginning you should be pardoning me for using these table numbers so but eventually you will get used to it make note of these table numbers they are very relevant so there is a gap if I use the option to there is a gap in it which is the right way of reporting this the answer to it comes from table 8 so the table 8 is a reconciliation of my credits away with the counterparty submissions that is 2a so before moving on to table 8 one academic question I have made some purchases I have my DC inward entry at the security register the, uh, my supplier has raised an e-bill I have the physical copy of the invoice I have made the payment through check and I have a proof of payment I have availed this credit it is not appearing in my 2A is that an eligible credit yes no maybe no, I, I must claim and then let on it. Yeah, he has. He in, if I log into the portal, it shows that he has filed the returns. See, we can see anyone's returns whether they filed or not. He has filed the returns, but not there in my 2A. <coughs> so, again, this is one burning issue, burning question. <coughs> so, you should consider whether you would want to take those credits or not. Alright? Coming back to table 8. Table 8 is an explanation of this transaction. 8A says how much of the credits are appearing in the 2A pertaining to you. How much counterparty has filed the returns and how much of the credits are appearing. This is compared with your table 6B. So your 8B is auto populating how much of the credits you have availed. And there could be a situation where you have made the purchases but the credit you have availed in the current year. Please note, when it comes to the input tax credit, the month in which you have availed the credit, it belongs to that year. When it comes to the liability, the month in which the transaction occurred. So a liability of March 18, even though you paid the taxes in June 18, it travels back to 17, 18. But an input tax credit where you made the purchases counterparty available in 2A in the month of March 18, you have availed it in June 18, it goes as an input tax credit for the financial year 18-19 and not 17-18. Alright? So that is those credits which you have availed subsequently gets reported in your table 8C. Now you have a comparison if there is a difference between your submission and the counterparty submission gets reported in 8D. Going back to that example, where I said 100 erroneously availed in Jan, reversed 19 Feb, net avail is 10. If I go with the option 1 of showing 100 in 6, 90 in 7 and the 10 in 7J, what would happen is 8A would show that counterparty submission is 10. You have availed it as 100. Your 8B will now come as 100 and your 8D will show a negative 90 which states that you have excess claimed 90. Right? There is nothing wrong about it. You will get one good love letter. You have to give an explanation why there is a difference. So department is waiting for your GSTR 9 to be filed. So automatically the notices. This is all system driven uh, notices. So whenever there is a mismatch that uh, system would trigger. But you should be ready with an explanation whenever there is a difference. How receiving notice is nothing wrong. Like if there is a business which is done 10 years and there are no notices received, you should be surprised. Having a notice but without an explanation is something you should be worried about. Yeah. And how much ever be the deviation? Like in this example, out of 100, 10 is only the credit. 90% is the deviation. It doesn't mean that the, there is a huge deviation and there is something grossly wrong. And as long as you have any notice or any deviation explainable, it's all valid and perfectly fine. 
So like your 2A credits, you have a down portion where your IGST on import of the goods, how much taxes have been paid, how much have been availed is reported. And whatever the credits which are not availed is something which is like lapse. Let's understand this business of the lapse little with an example. Generally, my credits which there in counterparty 2A are total credits, both your 4A and 4D credits. What you generally take to your electronic credit ledger is only eligible credits. Whatever you report it in 4D doesn't travel to your electronic credit ledger. It is only for in your information. Right? So they are all your ineligible credits. So your 2A has both eligible and ineligible credit. Let's take an example of total credits being 200 of which 155 is an eligible credit and 45 is an ineligible credit. Of 155, you would have availed it in this financial year 17, 18, 80 and financial year 18, 19, 40. So your 8A would start with 200, 8B would be 80, 8C would be 40. So you have a difference of 200 minus 120, 80 rupees difference. This difference is explained 45 is an ineligible credit would be lapsed and 35 is an eligible credit by forgot to take the credit or it might include the credits which do not pertain to you it is just appearing in your credit ledger and you have not taken it and these are the credits which are appearing but it would be lapsing it is just a reconciliation between your credits but most of the cases the scenario is reverse what is there in 8A is 200 what is there in your 8B is 500 you have credits availed in 3B substantially higher than what is there in 2A. In that situation your 8D would be negative. So you need not report further on 8E and 8F. So it is just a counterparty comparison. If you have some credits missing it is not an indication that you have to reverse. But it is an indication that there is a gap. What do you do if 8D is negative? If 8D is negative, you will have you will not have a further reporting under 8E or 8F. But if 8D is negative, but with a lower value. In this example, my reversal to be done is 80. But my 8D computation is coming to say 50. Between 50, how do I allocate between 8E and 8F? What is the priority I should be giving it? It's again your personal call whether you would want to report the all ineligible credits first or the eligible credits which are lapsed. Generally as a practical view, you report your ineligible credits first and the balance attributed to the eligible credits which are lapsed but is purely your call. Can the taxpayer legally claim the input tax credit in 3B without reflecting in 2A is a question. Answer I am leaving it to you. You are the best judge for it. Moving on to the part 4, table 9, it is a tax payable and paid information. This is a statement of fact. In table 9, it is auto populated with the tax payable and paid basis, your 6.1 of GSTR 3B, the offset liability register. So you have hardly anything to do because it is a matter, of, you have, the fact is you have paid the taxes. Some taxes have been paid through cash, some taxes have been paid through credit. You cannot amend anything in this table other than the tax payable column. So the tax payable column in table 9, you can edit to the value which you think is the right tax payable, you can report it. But the tax paid, you cannot amend it because that's a fact that you have paid some taxes. So if the table 9 is not editable for tax paid, if I have paid extra taxes, what do I do? You do nothing. You have an option to adjust it in the future. You can report it as a negative taxes in table 14 or if you have claimed as a refund, you would report the details of refund in table 15. Can there be an inter-adjustment in the tax payable in table 4? Which is, my tax liability is correct. I would want to disclose the same 18 lakhs as my tax liability but instead of CGST as 9 lakhs and SGST 9 lakhs, can I disclose it as 18 lakhs IGST? The answer is no. In table 4, you would only be disclosing the taxes which have been paid. In this case, you have not paid the IGST. You cannot report the taxes which have not paid in table 4. So when I am saying the tax liability, the liability has to be read 
each head separately you cannot do an intra adjustments in the GSTR 9 so the payments which are made through DRC 03 how do I report is a question so the tax payable column in GSTR 9 table 9 is also an editable a view can be taken that DRC 03 payments which are making additionally I may include it in the table 9 moving on to one important part of the table which is subsequent period adjustments table 10 11 12 13 14 so what can be considered in this part in this part you can consider the transactions of the previous financial year but you have paid the taxes in the current financial year so in table 4 you have reported whatever the turnover on which taxes which have been paid between July to March now the taxes which you have paid between April to September the taxes which have been paid between April to September should only be considered here so if the taxes are not paid between April to September you cannot consider in this table in fact some of the, are of the view that I should extend this word of September to the March the expansion of September to the March happened only for availment of input tax credit under 16.4 or reporting of missed out turnover under section 37 the removal of difficulty order did not extend to section 39 where the payment of the taxes to be done or the returns to be paid so the taxes to be paid can be considered here is only the taxes paid in 3b between April 2018 to September 2018 <coughs> likewise for input tax credit whatever is the input tax credit of the earlier financial year which you have missed out availing availed in the current financial year so when it comes to the ITC you can read it as a financial year and not the September or input tax credit availed in the earlier financial year which you are reversing in the current financial year is what you are reporting so table 10 is increase in liability owing to additional tax payment table 11 is adjustment of the excess taxes paid in the earlier period to the current period so you can have an upward liability or a downward liability but it is only what you are reporting is a statement of the fact you are not creating a new liability if you have not paid the taxes through through 3b in the current financial year you cannot report it in table 10 the liability on account of table 10 and 11 is considered in table 14 which is the net tax impact table 12 and 13 is only your information table you are not availing an input tax credit or reversing an input tax credit you are only reporting what has happened please read GSTR 9 is an information table or information reporting data it is not a place where you will be now availing credit if you have availed an erroneously a wrong credit in 1718 and you realize that it is a wrong credit you cannot report it in table 12 that okay there is an ineligible credit taken you can report it in table 12 only if it is reversed if it is not reversed you cannot report it in table 12 reversal of the credits happen in 3b those credits which you have reversed subsequently or availed subsequently can only be reported in table 12 and table 13 so payment of taxes on account of these adjustments are there in table 14 so if I have to explain about input tax credit credits which I have availed in last year is in say, table 6 and credits which I have availed in the current year is in table 13 credits which I have reversed in the last year is in table 7 credits which I have reversed in the current year is in table 12 so it is a reporting of the statement of the fact you are not availing a new credits nor reversing a new credits through GSTR 9 so one point one has to be careful when you are reporting it in GSTR 9 moving on to part 5 other information I will not spend much time on this because madam has clearly explained so table 15 talks about demands and refunds the only point one should be careful about demands is uh, refunds is you would only apply for GST related refunds you will not include VAT or service tax related refunds second you will only report refunds which you have applied for you will not ref report the refunds which you think you should get the refund so whatever the refund application made is in 15A 
of the refund application, whatever is sanctioned in 15B, whatever is rejected in 15C, whatever is pending in 15D. So this is a statement of the fact for the financial year 17-18, what you have done. It is not what you intend to do it. Same goes with the demands. So whatever is the demand raised is in 15E, out of the demands raised in the taxes paid is in 15F and pending in 15G. One other point one need to know about refunds is, whenever you are making exports with, or with payment of tax, even shipping bill number, shipping bill itself is treated as a refund, that value is to be included. And the for demands, you should only include GST demand, you cannot include the VAT or the other service tax, other liabilities. Mere show cause notice received is not a demand, you would not be including it. If there is appeals or anything, you should be consider, consider that because that's also a demand which is raised and paid. So the appeals may also to be considered. And when I'm saying demands, you should include the e-waybill related demands also in it. It is not just the tax demand, it is also other than taxes, interest penalty, any other demands you should, should be included in it. Then section 16, let me uh, skip it. Then comes section 17, HSN wise summary. So, you can plainly adopt this data from GSTR 1. The only gap between GSTR 1, table 12 and table 17 of GSTR 9. In table 12 of GSTR 1, you are giving HSN wise taxable value and the turnover in the taxes. When it comes to the GSTR 9, you would have to give rate wise information which is not there in GSTR 1. This is one additional data. But the same benefit exists up to one and a half crore you need not report the details in uh, the this table and one and a half crores uh, to five crores uh, two digits more than five crores four digits the same thing is applicable. The second caution you should have is whenever you are reporting the HSN code and the tax rate the taxable value or the tax calculated should be matching exactly. You cannot have a rounding of number to the PISA both the taxes have to be matched only then the portal will allow for submission. So the fifth item as a point of the checklist, whatever the value which is coming under table 7, you should correlate with the value which is coming under 5N, whatever is the liability read with table 10 and 14, whatever the value of liability you are disclosing in those tables, vis-a-vis -vis the tables which is there in this is the another consideration, one should be having it. The HSN wise inward also to be reported, the only point, uh, good thing is only individual HSN accounting more than 10% of the total purchases is what to be reported, otherwise reporting under this table is not applicable. Table 19, late fees, so a one table you need not be worried of, you need not do any data entry. If you are filing late, it will automatically auto populate. If there is a balance in the cash ledger, it will automatically detect, uh, detect that balance. Only then it will create a liability. So before you move to this table, after you fill all the tables on the portal, you have a button called Compute Liabilities. You click on the Compute Liabilities, it will compute, uh, do some internal calculations. Then you will move to the next table, next button for submitting. So a quick recap of the table numbers one needs to remember. Your 4N is the taxable outward supplies plus reverse charge where you have total liability. 5N is something you should reconcile with your P&L account. 6O is the gross input tax credit availed. 7J is the net input tax credit availed which should reconcile with your summation of your electronic credit ledgers. 8D is something which is going to be lapsed so you should pay attention to. Table 10 and 11 is the taxes which you paid in the current period. Table 12 is the earlier year ITC reversed. Table 13, earlier year ITC availed. 14 is the differential taxes paid. So these table numbers are critical. Before you submit your GSTR 9, you cross verify these tables. Because once you file your GSTR 9, there is no look back. You cannot edit the details. It is, it is submitted. And you are giving a declaration acknowledging saying that everything is true and correct pertaining to financial year 17-18. So you should be careful in taking the values. Now what are the adjustments that would undergo in the financial year 18-19 because of submission in your GSTR 9 for 17-18. So before looking at what are the values which undergo, couple of things one should be having a practice of recording 
the a month closure entries, a GST closure entries. Whenever, see generally the everyone has a practice of recording input tax credit, maybe in detail, CGST input 20, 14%, 6%, so rate wise some would, someone would create, someone would create one gross ledger, whatever be the methodology of recording the accounting entries, whether detailed or summation. The month in which you are filing your the returns, you should record your entries. So whenever you have an input tax credit, whenever you have a liability, so first upon disclosure of liability in GST or 3B, in table 3 you are disclosing something as your liability. So you are creating a liability into your electronic credit ledger. So you are now recording in your books of accounts as the electronic credit ledger. You are offsetting with your book liability of CGST liability ledger or output CGST ledger, whatever the ledgers one maintains. So the advantage of it is you have a proper replica of your electronic credit registers. Second, ideally these ledgers should be becoming zero. So it will also serve as an audit trail. And you would be recording both for forward charge liability and reverse charge liability. Likewise, you will be recording your input tax credits. So you will offset your credit ledger and recognize the credits moving to your electronic credit ledger based on the table 4. And you may consider parking some credits which are reversing under table 4B. So you can debit to the party account where you have not paid or missing into your whatever. You can have an additional control accounts. But you are now recording your liabilities as per your electronic credit register. And the moment you make the payment of the cash, you record it in your electronic cash ledger. And whenever you offset the entries, whenever you do an offset liability using table 6.1 of GSTR 3B, you would offset your electronic credit registers and liability register. Electronic cash and credit, you will be crediting it. Your liability register, you will be debiting it. By doing so, you have a track of what has happened in the financial year 1718. And if there are any balances in you, your books of accounts, you have an explanation for it. So those entries which have left over is now dealt in the financial year 1819. What are the things you will be dealing in the financial year 1819? Is the taxes you are disclosing in table 10 and 11. Which means these taxes are not, though paid in the current year, these taxes are not for the current year. You have to split the value which is there in table 10, 11 or net whatever the value which is there in table 14. You have to reckon these values as if it is pertaining to 17, 18 in your books of accounts. Then the values of table 12 and 17, 13 which is ITC of the previous year which is accounted in the current year or reversed in the current year. So in the financial year 18, 19 you have to ensure whatever the values you have reported in 17-18 table 12 and 13 should have an accounting entry for the financial year 18-19. 6-H, you are saying these are the credits which are re -availed, reversed and re -availed. So it is a maybe 16-4, I have not paid to the vendor within 180 days and I have paid maybe after an year later. Whenever I am making the payment of the uh, money to the supplier, I am eligible to reclaim those credits. So you should also have a track of the credits which have been parked or reversed and which can be reclaimed subsequently. Those credits should find a separate accounting entry in your books of accounts. So whatever the items which you are seeing on the screen, you should have a separate ledger be created because these are the transactions are not pertaining to your current financial year. These are happening from a different financial year and you should have a track it. So when you eliminate from your current year accounting entries, then when you do the offset entry, you will also have a track of those credit entries becoming zero. Additional cash payment which you are doing through DRC 03, the, even these entries do not tend to the current tax period. So you are making an additional payment after GSTR 9. Once you file your GSTR 9, you get the DRC 03 payment. So you, you are explicitly saying that the taxes of the 1718 not there in table 4, not there in table 10. So you are now paying it in DRC 03. Again to this extent you should have a separate provision in the books for either 17-18. So in financial year 18-19 you should unreckon these payments which has happened under DRC 03 for GSTR 9 as if these taxes are not for 18-19 and it is for 17-18. So these are the, and the last thing. In table 16 you are reporting 
There are some supplies which has made uh, say 143 you did not receive the goods from the job worker within uh, one year or 31 subsection 7 goods sent on sale or approval basis did not receive in 6 months. You are reporting it in uh, table 16 so which will be treated as a deemed supply. They, again there is an additional liability that gets created which you should again recognize as an additional liability in the books of accounts. So while finalizing your books of accounts for 1819, you should also pay attention to these values which are there in GSTR 9 of 1719 and accordingly finalize your books of accounts. So broadly these are the various issues under GSTR 9 and the considerations you should be taking care before you finalize your GSTR 9. So this is the, the sum and substance. Now we are open for any questions. Yes. Explain to my monitor 
and uh, uh, bring it to NIMC as additional recommendation uh, liability by auditor so that I can explicitly record this as even though I missed out in the previous years, I can have a record to say that that liability has been paid now. That is one option. Other one is I can go to Sector 26 of December uh, 17 and I will pay through next possible GST or TV. But that case, uh, as a summary uh, reporting, I may not be able to have a line to line tracing of what the liability I paid. Later I need to explain it if there is a change in accountant or if there is a change in record, if I am not able to trace it perfectly, then I may get stuck somewhere. Is it uh, okay that I disclose what about the additional liability I get it through GST admin, disclose it to GST auditor, have it recorded in GST MIC and then pay it out so that I can have a clear record of those liability mistakes still I paid it with interest. Yeah, so the question again is, uh, again, see the most of the questions again doubts would Right now the doubts on taxes paid is resolved because we know taxes have been paid on the other places. The question is not taxes which has not been paid. So can I ignore it in GST R9 and as in the GST audit, anyhow as a GST auditor, I have an obligation to record my taxable turnover and the liability and, and give the differences in table 8 of GST R9 C, give the tax payable details in table 9 and an explanation of the short payment in table 10 and the final liability is disclosed in table 11 of 9C. Can I do it through uh, GSTR 9C? What is the recommended view is the question. Now definitely you can use the op uh, option of 9C. There is no harm in it. But again look at the cases where the tax audit is GST audit is not applicable. So how do you discharge the liability where the GST audit is not applicable? So you should still consider that the payment of taxes to be done, my view, do it through DRC 03 of GSTR 9 itself because the expectation for 9C is not just that this measure of turnover, the expectation is an audit. What is the view of the SSC and what is the correct view? So in spite of DRC 03 and everything, whether the total turnover have to be considered for the taxes have been considered or not, is there some turnover which missed out? or the turnover has been considered but the tax rate has missed out and there is a liability or the tax rate and turnover is correct but the input tax credit should have been taken is missed out so auditor is looking at the books of accounts and what is there in GSTR 9 when I am doing an audit under GSTR 9C I, have, I will not pay any attention to both 1 and 3B I would only look at what is there in 9, what is there in books of accounts and I would see 9 as your final submission and I will take it so only the difference of opinion in my view to be taken into 9C and whatever you are agreeing, you pay it under 9. Because this, uh, if I, if I, if the, when we go to this slightly the uh, earlier discussion, we just discussed that we don't have a place where we can declare the turnover, missed out turnover in 9. In that case, anyway it will prompt the auditor to give us a uh, difference between my books of accounts and 9. If I but when you are paying DRC 03, you would be selecting to because of annual return and offsetting it. So, this is like how do we... In the audit, we take cognizance of events occurring after the balance sheet. Then this is a valid. Like take a case of a place where you have ever an input tax credit, ineligible. Do you think that the auditor will add it as a liability? Auditor will not add it as a liability as long as you have reversed in the current year. If you are disclosing it in table 12, auditor will take cognizance of it and not create a liability in 9C. If the auditor ignoring that creates a liability in 9C, there are two liabilities that would that are arising. So it, it's like uh, the reason, the difference will be a point out, but when the reason comes, he will explain that as a spade. And there is no liability. So, yes. yes. Okay. So question of purchase and purchase return. Okay. Instead of taking that question specifically of purchase and purchase return, I would say that you should look at your table 4A, 4B uh, holistically where your input tax credit you have availed gross and reversed in 4B. So, should how do I consider it reporting in my uh, the returns? And there are situations where some of some dealers have considered, some registered payers have considered purchase returns as outward liability and pay taxes in 3 and sales return as considered as input tax credit and take it under table 4. All those things have to be unreckoned. Purchase returns Unless otherwise it's forming part of your sales and you are issuing a tax invoice, only then it should go to the table 3 of liability. So it is you should treat them as if that there are any other errors and you should apply the same logic and correct it. But the issue that comes is that becomes credit not away. The understanding can be there is obviously that you are running is uh, because 100 
minus 20 AD, and you just mentioned 80, have you of this news that 20 have not availed itself, so don't think about it, that's lost to you. So, uh, the view is, the purchase return, if I take a net, it would show that as if the credit is not availed and the uh, issue may come up as the you are losing the credit. When you look at your 2A, 2A part A has three tables. I am ignoring part B and part C. Part A table 3, 4 and 5. So whenever you are thinking that the entire credits of 2A are available, firstly you should unreckon what are the entries which are there in part uh, in table 4 of part A of 2A. Table 4 is reverse charge credits. So what are the credits eligible is table 3 and table 5. Again in table 5, it is not a credit that you are taking, you should actually reverse. Your credit note entries are parked in table 5 of 2A. So the net credit which is there is your table 3 minus table 5 considering there are no debit notes. So your 2A would also show as 80. So in the case of the question of purchase returns, if I am showing a net credit, it would, would it appear as if I am taking a short credit? Again the answer is no. Your 2A would also show a lower credits. Any view where the dealer has surrendered the registration between the period July 17 to March 18, what will be the liability of filing this annual return? Yeah. So, who is the registered person? Home sir is registered. Who should file the annual return? Home sir is registered. I have surrendered my registration in the month of February 2018. Should I file the annual return? As on 31st March 2018, my registration doesn't exist. Should I need to file the return? The answer is yes. During the financial year 17-18, if you are registered, you will be filing your annual return. It's like you had some income, you have to pay it on taxes, you have paid the taxes, you would have to file your annual return. So the next question comes is, I do not have the login details. So the portal, they are now restoring, they are finding, they, they said they would give a mechanism of filing the annual returns for the distance which are being closed. So that maybe when the offline utility web they will launch it, they would give a mechanism of putting that up. So all right. So sure, lunch is also waiting for you. We can take some questions offline. And thank you very much for your patience with me. Thank you. I request members to for two minutes to conclude the session. Uh, we have come to an end of an uh, interesting and interactive session and tables so again uh, issues in GST are nine. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I thank uh, Vinay Gopal for his time and efforts of sharing knowledge in uh, GST are nine. Uh, may I request uh, our MC member Panindra Gupta to present a memento as a token of uh, gratitude and respect. Now we will break for lunch and we will be assembled by 2.30 for the third technical session.